Hey there, VC. Uh, I'm doing this video today to kind of bear the torch as the vinyl community's number one weeaboo. Now, this is actually the second time I've tried to record this video. Um, the first time I got about five minutes in in my SD card fried. Press F to uh, pay respects to my SD card. Um, we're going to talk about two albums today and kind of how I ended up going about learning about these various artists. And these are two um, albums I got from Japan. And uh, they're both albums from the early 70s in Japan, and they both uh, more or less get categorized into um, Japan's burgeoning folk rock scene at that time. So it's no secret that, you know, I talk about a lot of Japanese music on this channel and um, Japanese albums. Most of my familiarity and taste with Japanese music comes from, um, you know, some of the underground Visual K in the 90s, and then also some of the more mainstream new wave stuff in the 80s, and also a little bit of the hair metal, things like that. Um, that's always kind of what I've known the most about and been the most comfortable with. And I've always tried to kind of expand my taste out from there, talk, think about and explore, you know, who were these artists influences? You know, what was the scene like at that time? I take it as kind of a of a uh, fact-finding challenge in a way because so much of this information just isn't really available out there in English. Like, no one in America or English-speaking countries cares all that much, especially when you go outside Visual K. Visual K has always kind of had a underground audience in the United States. Um, in kind of like anime circles and things like that, but but interest in wider Japanese popular music has never really been much of a thing. Um, and so finding a lot of this information is really just like shooting into the dark. And to me, as a, as a record collector and someone that enjoys exploring the music of the past, um, it's such an exciting journey to do that. So in previous videos, uh, I know I brought up a 1980s group called Bowie, and Bowie was very important in kind of popularizing um, the rock group as a, as a real uh, force in Japan at a time when pop music and um, disco and things like that were really king. And a few months ago, before the whole pandemic hit, um, one of the I ordered some Bowie records, and one of the sellers I bought a uh, I bought two Bowie records and I think a Ruage record. Uh, I bought from they included a free seven inches a gift, and the seven inch they included was um, a 1979 single by Kenji Sawada called Casablanca Dandy. Now, I don't have that particular seven inch on hand here because I'm, I'm, I'm stuck in Texas at the moment, but um, it was kind of a cool, funky, uh, rockin' single that, you know, um, is not the first thing I would reach to. There's something really exciting about playing a record blind, just, just getting something in the mail, putting it on, and not having any idea what it's gonna sound like and being pleasantly surprised. So I did a little research on Kenji Sawada, and um, I found out, well, A, he's kind of a, a large celebrity in Japan, and his solo career stems out of his activity in the 1960s uh, rock group era of Japan that is commonly referred to as group sounds. So group sounds is the term used to describe uh, rock groups and almost like boy bands that were very popular in Japan in the late 1960s that were really a Japanese take on um, British invasion style pop rock music. Um, there were three pretty influential um, group sounds bands at that time. Um, the biggest ones I was able to uncover were um, the Tigers, the Tempters, and the Spiders. Kenji Sawada, this person I had this, this uh, seven, solo seven inch from, um, was the uh, lead singer of the Tigers in the Group Sounds era. And that leads me to the record I have here. This is original first album by the Japanese rock group PYG. So how did we get to PYG? So at the end of the, uh, like 1970-71 was when a lot of the Group Sounds bands ended up stopping, discontinuing um, activity. Uh, and Kenji Sawada was playing with the Tigers, who broke up in 1971. Uh, so in 1971, Kenji Sawada, along with members of the other three big group sounds bands that I just mentioned, uh, the Tempters and the Spiders, formed this group called PYG, which was kind of a super group. Um, a really good parallel that I'm going to compare this record to and this group to is probably Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. Um, 
it's a, they, they came together in a very similar way and actually in a lot of ways the music is very similar there's um, very similar kinds of vocal harmonies this nice balance of like folk music and and uh, more psychedelic style rock it, it's a really great combination and I think if you like Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, you're really going to like PYG, original first album. This is this came out in 1971. This is the only studio album by PYG. And uh, after this, they released one live album in 1972, and then they stopped activity. And uh, a lot of the members went on to do solo work, like Kenji Sawada, who started a pretty prominent solo career. So when I was actually listening to more Kenji Sawada on YouTube, one of the suggested videos was kind of this little TV documentary uh, that turned out to be about PYG. Um, I watched it because I thought it was about Kenji Sawada, and it turns out it was about PYG because there were no subtitles. I was just kind of watching people talk in a language I didn't speak and listening to the music they were playing throughout. And then I heard a song that I recognized. Um, and that was uh, the song Flower Sun Rain by PYG that was their probably, from what I can gather, their biggest single. And I go, I've heard this before. Where have I heard this song before? I, I know I've heard this before. Someone's covered this. So I've definitely heard a cover of this song before. And it took a, and I had to, so I kind of went in my, my iTunes hard drive, whatever, and, and started searching for Flower Sun Rain. And what I discovered is, oh, this was covered by Boris. The album that Flower Sun Rain, the cover by Boris, uh, appeared on is their 2008 album Smile, which I don't have here. But yeah, Boris covered this on their album Smile, and I've listened to it like dozens of times. It's one of my favorite Boris albums. And I've talked about Boris many, many times on this channel. I got out here, um, one album I do have by them here is their probably their most well-known album, which is Pink, which is has a very similar sound to um, their sound on Smile. But anyway, I just thought that was so interesting because here I'm, I have this connection between this artist I was discovering and this artist I already knew and appreciated, and apparently the artist I already knew and appreciated appreciated PYG just as much. This is not the original 1971 uh, pressing. This is a 1980 repress because it was much more affordable to pick up. Although I don't think it would cost too much money to get an original of this, but I just, I, I went for a, a clean repress and um, especially because this took three months to get to me. Um, thank you, pandemic, COVID-19. Uh, give up trying to order records from overseas because uh, this, this sat in Japan for three months. So my interest in um, PYG and the group sounds kind of bands that they spawned out of didn't really end there. I also picked up this CD, yeah, I bought a CD. You know, this contains other members of PYG, and this is a, a complete singles collection by The Tempters. Who, you know, when I, when I just, of the stuff that I've heard and I go back and kind of try to listen objectively to all these various group sounds, bands that I've, I've become familiar with in this short time. Um, to me, I think The Tempters were the best. I think The Tempters had the most interesting sound. And um, actually, one of my favorite songs that I've heard on this collection is uh, not one of their original songs, it's a cover they did of um, Live for Today by, ooh, I'm blanking on, um, I'm blanking on the name of the group. Oh, it, it's, I think it's the Grassroots. One, two, three, four,
Yeah, so they did a cover of of the very famous kind of 60s pop tune, Live for Today, and they did it in Japanese. And I, uh, it's actually really good, and I kind of maybe like it more than the original song. Maybe. Um, yeah, so I, I picked this up just because I was interested in more of that, that, that 60s group sound stuff that just we're never going to hear about over here. So the other record that I made this video to talk about is a, a kind of a different record. It's also a early 70s folk rock record from Japan. And this is the 1972 album by Kan Mikami, Hiraku Yume Nado Arujanashi. I hope I didn't butcher that. It seems like the closest English translation would be uh, There Are Open Dreams or something similar to that. But anyway, this is a 1972 uh, folk album by Kan Mikami or Mikami Kan. And uh, this is the original pressing on URC Records, which was an underground indie uh, Japanese folk label. But Kan Mikami also recorded a, a handful of albums on Columbia in the 70s. He recorded on both URC and Columbia. And um, it, it's hard as an outsider to Japanese culture to really get a handle on um, Kan Mikami because he seems to be a very controversial and polarizing figure in Japanese music. Um, I believe I read that one of his uh, albums on Columbia was actually pulled from the shelves because of um, its contents, where he was very critical of modern Japanese society. He was also very, um, some of his, his lyrics were quite uh, obscene, um, or they would be considered obscene, uh, very graphic. Um, he really didn't, uh, he didn't coat a lot of his uh, lyrics in any flowery prose. They were quite um, upfront from what I've been able to gather. And he also sang in this, uh, especially on this album, he sang in this expressive, uh, almost violent manner that to him seemed to be a reflection of the violence of, of modern life. <laughs> A very someone I'm really curious to learn more about. He actually has an autobiography that was published uh, maybe less than ten years ago, and it was actually translated to English. And I'm trying to hunt down a copy. Um, it's called A Life in Folk, and um, it seems to be not in print anymore. And I'm trying to trying to track down one because I really want to read more about this person because it seems so interesting from the outside looking in. But um, I want to talk a little bit about this album specifically. This was an album that I literally just discovered in YouTube recommendations. Um, and the full thing's on YouTube. I'll try to link it below. It's also, I think it might be on Spotify. I'm not sure. Um, I know it's not on Tidal, that's for sure. Um, but of, of, the, of, the, of the Khan Mikami albums that I've kind of skimmed over, um, this one seems to be the one that I'm most drawn to. So it was the one I decided to go in for. His voice... Uh, on this record is uh, gravelly and bitter and emotional and it and it almost reminds me of uh, Captain Beefheart's vocals in a lot of his 70s albums but I think in Captain Beefheart's uh, Captain Beefheart's uh, vocal aesthetic there's more of a hint of absurdity and satire and I think Khan Mikami is his delivery is the same kind of like vocal rasp and and pain and grit in the voice, but it's just it, it seems like it's a little more serious and a little more heartfelt and a little more direct to the point. <laughs> Um, a 
again, I don't speak Japanese, so the lyrics are a little bit lost on me, but if even just ignoring the lyrics, I think this album is so beautiful. There's a nice mix of, of rock instrumentals and um, subtle, uh, you know, folk guitar. Um, in many ways, the sound and the arrangements could be compared to like um, some of Bob Dylan's middle work with like uh, John Wesley Harding or Highway 61. But there's, they're far more dark, uh, far less um, kind of upbeat and whimsical. To be frank, I, I don't know if I've ever heard anything like this. Um, I think I've, I've stumbled onto just an artist who is through and through completely unique and really, uh, I'm just fascinated by his work and I can't wait to collect more albums by him. So it looks like this video will be uh, mercifully on the short side. I know in this community I am known for long and sometimes verbose uh, videos, but you know, these are the only two records I've gotten in the mail through the whole pandemic and it took them quite a long time to get here. But mostly I just wanted to kind of um, share with you my journey through discovering this music and kind of expanding um, my musical taste and interests um, through two albums that I think are just, both of these are just simply brilliant. Um, they really stand on their own, not so much as historical documents, but as, as albums that just deserve appreciation still today. Um, I think they're fantastic. Um, hopefully, maybe some of you will explore them on your own uh, when albums can be shipped internationally again. But um, I will provide links to ways to listen to both of these. I think both albums are actually on in full on YouTube. So I'll link those. I don't know how long those will stay up though. Um, I'll link those and I'm pretty sure at least one of them's on Spotify maybe. Um, unfortunately not Tidal, but it is what it is. I hope everyone is, is keeping safe. These are uh, difficult times um, we're in, in the world and in the United States. And, um, and I think that's even more reason to um, let music bring us comfort and joy. Because the the uh, the joy and exuberance and and comfort that art and music bring is something that everyone I think needs to experience to live a healthy and uh, sane life, especially um, during a pandemic. So um, if I have people in my community that are actually familiar with this music, um, feel free to further educate me because I'd love to know more. Or you know what what your experience has been in like 1970s Japanese music because um, it's it's something I'm continuing to explore and um, try to be more versed in and try to uncover more about. Um, for those that are approaching this music for the first time and I may be your introduction to it, I'd love to hear what you think about these two albums because I just think they're brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So as always, um, stay safe and I will see you guys in the next video. Cheers. Konichiwa, bitches. <laughs>